Well, hey, everybody. God bless. Welcome to the local church online. So good to see you virtually today. Uh, I'm Johnny. I'm one of the pastors here at the local church. Uh, Hey, if you're a guest this morning or today, we just want to say a special shout out to you. Uh, We don't believe it's an accident that you're here. And we're so glad that you are joining us. I just want to remind you, fill out that connect card if you would. Uh, You can get to know us a little better. We get to know you a little better as well. And we have a free gift for you. It's just our way of saying, man, we're glad that you're tuning in today. We've been in this series now. I think this is our third week and it's called Reset. And so Reset, here's what we're doing in Reset. We're getting back to some of the foundational principles, some of the foundational spiritual disciplines uh, as we reset and as we get ready to re-enter the building. Uh, We're hoping that that's very soon. I know you're hoping that's very soon. We really miss you guys. Uh, We really do as a staff and pastors. We miss you. We pray for you all the time. That's going to happen fairly soon. But in the meantime, we got to get ready. And so we are resetting back to some of these foundational uh, things. And so, you know, the first week, Pastor Eric talked really through Matthew 6, 33. It was really a polemic uh, talking through that whole um, Matthew 6, 33 verse. And it was seek first the kingdom of God. Say it with me if you know it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And so really our first week was about getting started right, getting back to the very foundation, seeking first God's kingdom really rather than uh, our own. And then into the second week, it was about getting back to the word of God and our love for God's word, which is our protection and our truth. And so today, as we talk about this foundational uh, reset, we want to get back to serving. Okay, everybody say serving, serving. We want to get back to to serving. And please don't tune us out because you think you know what serving is. Uh, You're going to be challenged today. You really, really are. It's more than just action. Uh, Serving comes from the heart. It comes out of a heart of love. And we're going to look at that really in depth. But as you know, we've been talking through the Nintendo Entertainment System. Yes, and give me a thumbs up if you, if you really, that takes you back to a really good time in your life. A simpler time, like Pastor Eric used to say, a simpler time when, man, you could just sit and play video games, right? All day. Those days are long past for me. But thinking back, you know, one of my favorite characters, now he's not iconic, but one of my favorite characters was, was Little Mac, you remember him? The, the boxer, right? The fighter, Little Mac. And as he would go through that progression and, and, and that whole queue of fighters that he had to get through, and then two, three years later, uh, it was Mike Tyson's punch out. Do you remember punch out and Mike Tyson's punch out? And so as Little Mac would go through this progression, he would transform. He had somebody in his corner helping him, but he would transform learning each time as he boxed and using it against the next person. And so as he would go through this progression of fights, he would transform into what he was designed to be. I want you to grab hold of that. He would transform into what he was designed to be as he would go through this process. As we go through the process of really serving others from a heart of love, from heart of God's love, it transforms us as well. We go from what we were created to be really to what we were designed to be. And, uh, and so I want to I want to use an illustration here, a, a real life person that that uh, has a little bit more than you might think in common with Little Mac. Think about Mother Teresa. You know, Little Mac was small, right? He was the smallest of all the fighters. Here's here's Mother Teresa, who's barely five foot, four foot and 11 and something inches, about 80 to 90 pounds. But as she goes through serving and spends decades as a servant, she transforms. She really does. She becomes some, some, uh, a person that no one knows her name to now a household word. Mother Teresa uh, went throughout the, the entire world setting up orphanages and other houses of refuge 
uh, and really serving humanity to where she was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And again, a household name. Here's the, here's the point and here's the, the, the idea is this, that as we serve, as we go through the process of serving throughout our lifetime, God transforms us similarly. He, he makes more out of us than we would ever be if we didn't do that. And so today we're going back to the foundational spiritual discipline of serving. We're going to talk about it. Where are we going to be in scripture? Well, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Let me give you just a little bit of background. Now, when I say 1 Corinthians 13, many of you right now in your mind, you're thinking the love chapter, right? Hit the heart button if that's you, if, you're, if, that, if that's what's going through your mind. I just did a couple of weddings uh, this month. And in each of those, I read through a portion of 1 Corinthians 13 because it is about love. But, but let me say something that may surprise you or even shock you. 1 Corinthians 13 is about love, but it's also about serving. 1 Corinthians 13 is some of the most beautiful words ever written. It's some of the most beautiful prose that was ever put on paper uh, in any genre, in any form of literature. Uh, and it's, it's beautiful and yet it's disturbing <laughs> as well because it is, uh, it, it's really the mark that's set for love and it's the mark that's set for serving. And so we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna unpack some of 1 Corinthians 13, but where was it written? Well, and who wrote it? Just a little bit of background before we get to it. The apostle Paul uh, is the author of the, uh, of the letter to the church at Corinth. Now, he wrote this from Ephesus. He's been about three years in Ephesus in one of his missionary journeys, and he writes to this church at Corinth. Well, why does he write to them? Well, because they had written to him first. They were having problems in their church. Uh, and I've heard it said, and I agree, that if the Apostle Paul were to write a letter to the modern church, I really believe that it would sound a lot like 1 Corinthians. I really believe that, that, that we go through a lot of the things that they went through, a lot of internal things, not just external. We've always had external, but this church had a lot of internal problems. There was sexual sin inside the church. There was drunkenness. They were using the Lord's Supper uh, to, to get drunk. Uh, there was a fighting in the church. There was spiritual narcissism. My gift's better than yours. Well, I speak in tongues more than you. Well, I speak in tongues better than you. They weren't completing the body of Christ. They were competing inside the body of Christ. And Paul had, had really, when he reads this, it troubles him. He's had enough. And he writes back to them this, this letter. And by the time he gets to the 13th chapter. Now you understand in the original letter, there wasn't chapter and verse. We've added that later to help us uh, find our way through these letters. But, but by the time he gets to that portion of his letter, he's really diagnosed the root issue. And it's sort of the capstone of 1 Corinthians. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's where we're gonna find ourselves. Uh, if you've got a Bible, if you've got the app, if you've got uh, a version on your phone, whatever, we're gonna spot you on the screen as well. Let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 13, we're gonna look at verses one through eight, A. Uh, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Paul's saying, I can be the best orator. I can be the best communicator. I can speak wonderfully to groups or to individuals. Uh, I can even speak the, the language of angels. If I speak in an unknown tongue and it sounds heavenly, but I don't have love, it's, it's, no, it's, it's good for nothing. I'm an obnoxious noise is what he's saying. Verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. In other words, I could be a thousand feet deep spiritually. I could know mysteries. I could know the word. I could move mountains with my faith. If I don't do it in love, it's worth nothing. Verse three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I serve others, and though I give my body to be burned, or even burned out, <laughs> which would be more uh, like today. But though I become a martyr, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. In verse four, he begins the descriptive version. What is love? Keep serving in mind as we talk about this. Love suffers long and is kind. I use suffers long because a lot of translators say patience, and that is the more modern word. Love is patient and kind. I want you to catch this. We're not gonna go back and touch on it much later. Love is patient. If you have a patience problem, hit, hit some thumbs up or let me know in the comments. Does anybody have a problem with patience? If you have a patience problem, you have a love problem. 
Love is patient. It doesn't say patience is patient. Love is patient. And it takes patience to serve other people. So love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself as some in in the church in Corinth were doing. It's not puffed up. In other words, it's not prideful. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not narcissistic. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't have a short fuse, in other words. It thinks no evil. It thinks the best of, of people. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity or sin, but it rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, And then verse eight, the first portion, love never fails or love never quits. Here's our first big thought today. It's the umbrella under which everything else is gonna come under. Write this in your notes if you're taking notes. To serve others well, we must love others well. To serve others well, we have to love others well. Now, I know I'm talking to somebody out there today and you've, from the first time I said serving people or or being a servant, you've got this in your mind. You're thinking, pastor, there's, there's a lot on my plate. It's a chore to serve other people. I mean, my, my plate w- went from uh, a, a, little, a little dinner plate in my 20s to a little bit bigger in my 30s, but now I'm in my 40s and we've got, I traded my dog for three kids and now I work 50 hours and now I'm, I'm going back to school. I'm working on an MBA and, and oh yeah, my mother-in-law just moved in with us. Pastor, I've got a platter. I don't have a plate. I've got a platter and it's, and it's full. Anybody feel like that? sometimes. How can I serve other people? It's not that I wish bad on other people. It's just, I've got my own stuff. I just kind of want to be, I'll do me and, and you do you and, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll all get along and we'll get there. Anybody feel like that sometimes? I, I, it's a chore to serve other people. Sometimes they're not appreciative, but always I've got a lot on my, my plate. And, and I mention this and I spend a little time on it because listen to me, church, that's me sometimes. Uh, that's me. Here's how it sounds uh, with me and in my season right now. If I'm complaining to the Lord about about serving, here's here's how it sounds uh, when it comes out of my mouth. It could be something like, Lord, you know, I've known you for over 40 years now. I've been a Christian, literally I have, over four decades. I've got like 10,000 hours or more of of counseling. That's that's 10,000 hours of sitting with people, of talking through some of the most intimate, troublesome, hard, difficult trials, sometimes uh, abuse, sometimes uh, just all kinds of things that you can't even imagine. I, I've got well over 10,000 hours of that, Lord. I, I even do things I'm not good at. I, I went to, to Budapest. I'm not a handyman, but I went with a whole other group of people that weren't handy either. And, and we tore down hundred year old walls. We tried to rebuild a home that was well over a hundred years old. We poured concrete. We've done all this stuff. God, I've served a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Can I just, I, I, I'm not young anymore. Can I just watch reruns of The Office? Can, can I just maybe sit around and watch Michael Scott say yesh, you know, or Kramer or can, can, can anybody fans of those shows? Uh, that's me. It's like, Lord, have I done enough? I get tired, God. Is it enough? And, and listen, my, my heavenly father, and I hope you know this, he's a good God. He's a good, good father. And, and I don't hear him here, but I hear him here when I, when I get in one of those seasons. And he always tells me, Listen, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. There's still a world that's full of hurt and pain. There's still a world that's full of confusion. There's a world that's full of anger. There's still a world full of lost people. I still have sheep out there that don't know me. You're not home yet, just a little bit longer. That's, that's what I hear. And listen, I want you to know this because uh, it's, it's okay to feel tired sometimes. It's not, and I want you to understand Write this down in your notes. We're gonna put it on the screen. It's not that we don't get tired. It's that we don't quit. Certainly love is gonna get tired. Love's gonna get stretched. Love's gonna get tried. Love's gonna get fatigued. But as it says in verse eight, chapter 13, verse eight A, it says love never fails. A better word there, an even more descriptive word is it never quits. Love never fails. Love doesn't quit. The agape that God has for you and me doesn't quit. When we serve others, it's not that we're not gonna get tired. We will, we will get burned out. I'm not saying that there can't be a season of self-care. There needs to be. But love doesn't fail. Love doesn't quit. 
And so how can I serve others? Now we've given a big sort of a 10,000 foot view uh, of, of serving, a big uh, sort of a spiritual beginning. How can I serve others? I wanna give you three practical ways. These are things that you can begin to do today to serve other people. We're gonna put these on the screen. I can meet their needs. I can speak good into their lives and I can talk to God on their behalf. I wanna say them again. Say them with me if you, if you can see them on the screen. I, wanna, I can meet their needs. I can speak good into their lives and I can talk to God on their behalf. Those are three ways that we can serve. Let's talk about those. The first one, I can meet the needs of people. I can meet their needs. First Corinthians 13, three, remember what it said. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, we are to be serving. That's what we're to be doing. And though I, I bestow all my goods, Paul's not saying don't do that. Paul's saying you do that, but you have to do it in love. Remember to serve people well, we have to love people well. So I give all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, but don't have love, it profits me nothing. Church, one of the most foundational ways that we can serve other people is by meeting their needs. I think about what God said, what Jesus said uh, when, he, when he said this, the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And meeting needs is so important that Jesus says that when we do it in his name, we do it really to him. Remember the cup of cold water. When you give someone a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, uh, you're doing it unto Jesus. You are serving him. So I want to encourage you today. You don't have to be a pastor, a missionary, an evangelist, a full-time vocationary worker. You don't have to be that to serve the Lord. When you give, when you meet needs, when you serve people, you're serving God. You can do that even today. Now, I want to put you at ease because I know this. Sometimes serving people can seem overwhelming. The needs are great. And I'm not going to try to convince you that they're not. Uh, there can be overwhelming needs in certain individuals, in certain families. Uh, and it can, again, it can seem over, overwhelming. It, it can seem too much. Lord, the need is this much and I only have this much. Please hear me clearly. Don't let that shut you down. The need is this much. I only have this much. Here's what I do and it really helps. I'm aware of, of the need that's this big, but I'm focused on what I have to give. I wanna say it this way, write this in your note. You can't do everything, but you can do something. You can't do everything. The need is this big. You don't have this much. I can't do everything. You've got this much, you can do something. I'm not going to be focused on the entirety of the need. That's overwhelming and it will shut me down. I am aware of the need, but I'm focused on what I have to give. And I thank God that I'm only one that he's calling to come alongside and to help this person. I'm thinking about our own church in this time of quarantine, in this time of, of isolation. Uh, we couldn't do everything. The needs of the community were great. Do you remember? Do you recall? I mean, we're still there to some degree. It's opening up and it's getting better. And we're noticing that even as a church. But especially six weeks ago, five weeks ago, eight weeks ago, man, it was, it was tough. The needs were overwhelming. We couldn't do everything. We had needs for, for housing and for food and for bills. And, 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 and again, people were, were sick. We couldn't meet all of the needs. We couldn't do everything, but we could do something. So for eight weeks, literally eight weeks in a row, we had food distribution. That's what we could do. We couldn't do everything, but we could do something. And we were able to bless our community for eight weeks in a row on Saturdays. Uh, and we, we actually blessed a, a local farm. We didn't just have everything donated. Uh, we got to go and partner with a farm and purchase boxes and, that were basic produce and vegetables. And then we added things onto that. And by the time you see this, we will have fed well over 2,000 families. I mean, well over 2,000 families that we have been able uh, to bless. We focused on what we have had. We didn't focus on what we didn't have. And let me also say this and brag on you a little bit, church. It is the goodness of God that made that possible. It really is. But it's your generosity as well. Uh, you didn't quarantine your giving, so to speak. You continued to give so that as the local church, we could continue to partner with the Davy police. We could partner with key volunteers that came in. We could partner with a local farm and be a blessing to them in this time. 
and we could be a blessing to our neighbors. I remember the very first food drive we did, I talked to the first person in line and she'd been in line since 2.30 in the morning because she'd always gotten there too late uh, at other food drives. So she was at our gate. It was locked, of course, middle of the night. She slept in her car. She got there at 2.30. We blessed her with food and I found a food card and we blessed her as well. So what, what can you do? That's what we did as a church. Remember, you can't do everything, but you can and you should do something. What can you do? Well, you can take people a meal. I can't cook. Go grab a, a box of, 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 of pasta and pasta sauce and a salad kit and some bread and, and, and sack it up or box it up and take it to somebody. Go, go do that a few times. Make some meals and spread that out. Here's something really cool. If you, if you know of a single mom that's struggling in, in this season, uh, on a Saturday, go get her car and take it to Jiffy Lube. Have, have the oil change. Pay for it. Pay for her car to be detailed. If you can afford it, take it to Tire Kingdom or somewhere. Put some new tires on her car. Be a blessing. You can buy food cards when you're at Publix. $25, $50, $100, whatever. And just put it away. Save it in your wallet. Save it in your purse. When you come across that need, you'll have it. Listen, church, we can't do everything. We know that. But we can do something. We can be part of God's plan to help bless this person. And so we can meet needs. That's the first way. Here's the second way. I can speak good into their lives. This probably is my favorite uh, way that that we're gonna talk about today. I can speak good into their lives. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Remember verse one. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So to love others well, to serve others well, I have to love others well. I wanna wanna focus just for a moment on this gift of language. Now we had a series last year on relationships and I taught a little bit, it was only a little bit on this particular idea, but this is speaking good into other people's lives. You have that ability. You've been given that. And I want you to think about this. You as a human being are the only thing, the only created thing that has the gift of language. Other things communicate. Whales communicate, dolphins communicate, birds communicate. We're the only ones that have the gift of language. We're the only ones that have been given the anatomy to to push air up through the the diaphragm into the throat, over the vocal cords, uh, across the tongue, in the mouth, and make uh, intelligible syllables and noises that we make sense of and we call language and we understand. Uh, We should be generous with that church. You can have that gift. You can serve somebody in this season by being nurturing, by being encouraging. Uh, You can serve them uh, with, with your language, with your words. We often forget about that. Now, I know that there's some people out there right now that are saying that's gonna be really tough because, Pastor, really my gift is sarcasm. Okay, anybody? Thumbs up on that. <laughs> sarcasm. But, but listen, this is a time to, again, just as, as little Mac goes through the process of serving and it transforms him, this will transform you. It'll transform you. Uh, I, I wanna put this down. I wanna put it on the screen. Write it in your notes. Good communication begins in the heart not the mouth. Good communication doesn't begin here. Good communication begins here. And this can really, again, help to transform you. If you're too impatient to really be nurturing, if you're too impatient uh, to really uh, be constructive and, and good and give away that gift of language, if you're too impatient and you just come across with satire or sarcasm or a cut down or a put down or, or whatever, then let God work on you. Practice being encouraging. Practice being nurturing. Practice makes perfect. Practice giving good language away. Love is patient, and it really shows up in our communication when we want to speak the good into others. And here's here's something else that I want to get to about communication because, and we'll miss it. We will not be nurturing. We won't be encouraging. It'll come across fake. It'll come across as disingenuous if we don't do this as well. You have to listen. Okay, this, is, this isn't just, I'm gonna throw some, some uh, encouragement bombs and drop the mic and walk away. This isn't that. Uh, this is entering their story. I'm gonna be encouraging. I'm gonna be loving. I'm gonna be uplifting. But I'm also gonna listen. Uh, And believe me, with everything that we've seen in the past several weeks 
Uh, we need to sit down and listen to one another. I want you to, to take this term with you. Take this term and, and use it today. Aggressive listening. Aggressive listening means I'm going to be super in, empathetic. I want to be empathetic like Christ. I want to enter their story. Uh, you talk about entering their story. Jesus literally entered our story. He empathized to the point that he became one of us. He listened. He loved. He served. He gave away. Read the Sermon on the Mount. That's beautiful language that he gives away that's encouraging. And so that's what you have to be. If you want to be good, a good communicator, if you want to give away this gift of language, man, you've got to be an aggressive listener. You have to be a good listener as well. We can do that, church. We can speak the good into others. Amen? Give me the thumbs up if you believe that. I believe that. Here's our last way that we can serve others. And again, you can do that. You can do this today. I can serve others by talking to God on their behalf. What does that even mean? I can serve others by talking to God on their behalf. It means I can take their needs. I can take their fears. I can take their, their anger. I can take their distraught state or their season that they're in. I can take that and I can lift it before the throne of grace and mercy. I want you wherever you are right now, just to do that. As you're sitting in your home, I want you to visualize it. That's what I do. When I pray for people, when I pray for you, uh, I visualize me literally taking you, your hurt, your pain, your sickness, whatever it is, taking it before the throne of grace and mercy and praying God's goodness and favor and healing, his presence over you. Uh, that, we can do that, church. We can take uh, and, and the, these needs, these hurts, these confusion, whatever it is, people that are lost or lost in their own story, and we can, we can talk to God on their behalf. I practice this nearly every day with my own family, uh, with Tracy, with my girls, with their husbands, uh, with, especially with our grandkids. I mean, they're just little. It's a fallen world. It's a scary place, and, and, and they're just little. I, I take them before the throne of grace and mercy. I speak protection over their lives. I want them to grow to have hearts like Jesus. I want them to change the world. I want them to know him. I want them to lean into, to, to lean into him and trust him for salvation and, uh, and for hope and for their life. I pray all of those things, but I do it. I visualize me literally taking them before the throne of grace and mercy. Church, we can do that. I can serve others by talking to God on their behalf. You can do that today, and you should do that today. Make that a practice. You're going to give away good communication, yes. I'm going to meet needs, yes. But I'm also going to do this. This is something only I know. I'm going to, I'm going to speak to God on their behalf. They don't even know it. I'm going to serve people by doing that as well. Here's our last thought for the day, and, and, and we're going to end here. We're going to end in just a couple of minutes. But I want you to think about it this way. I'm going to ask you a question. Where do you think Jesus spent most of his life? You know, uh, here's down in, in Jerusalem, down in Judea, there's the temple. I mean, there's the seat of, of spiritual Hebrew Judaism right down there. Uh, that's where people would bring their animals. That's where uh, all of the, the civil ceremonial things were. They would, they would all make uh, the, these trips down into Jerusalem and, and down to the temple. And, and you, if you're not careful, you think, well, Jesus probably spent most of his time down there around the religious folks and around the temple and all that. He didn't. 85% of, the, of Jesus' times that we know of in the gospel was spent up in Galilee near his hometown, Nazareth. That's why Matthew, speaking to the Jews, says Jesus of Nazareth. He wanted them to know, all the Jews to know, that this, is a guy, this was the guy from Galilee. And Galileans in that day, Jewish Galileans, were different than Judean Galileans, <laughs> a, or, than Judean Jews. G, uh, the Galileans that were Jews were different than, than those in Jerusalem that were, that were Jews as well. They looked a little different. There was a little bit a different ethnicity going on. They spoke different. There was a different twang to their voice. And many times they would be made fun of uh, when they came down for the, for the ceremonies or, the, or, or whatever it was they needed to go to Jerusalem for. Here's my point, is that Jesus spent most of his time up in Galilee where Jews would be on the west bank uh, of, of the Sea of Galilee. But there would be Gentiles and Greeks 
on the east bank. And Jesus spent time on both of those shores. And Jesus spent time in the trade routes. And Jesus spent time loving, serving, listening to people who didn't look like him, act like him, or think like him. Church, here's my challenge for you today. That is, we have to serve people well by loving people well. I want you to do this. I want you to pray about, think about, and go do. Go serve somebody who doesn't look like you. Serve somebody who doesn't think like you. Serve somebody who doesn't act like you. Give away what you have in the name of Jesus. Give a cup of cold water to somebody you may never get a thank you from, somebody you may never see before, somebody who doesn't look like you. Let's start doing that. Let's begin to change the world by serving the world. Are you with me? Are you with me, church? Amen. I want to pray for us now. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of serving. Thank you for the way that that transforms us, God. As we serve others, we become transformed into who you really designed us to be. Thank you for the greatest example of all, Jesus, who loved us so much, he became one of us. Lord, he's our example for empathy. He's our example uh, to give away good language, to meet needs. Lord, he spoke about others to you. He lifts us up even. And John, he tells us that he prays for us. So Lord, thank you for that example. Help us, God, to serve in that same way, with that same heart. Help us, Lord, to serve those, to be willing to serve those who don't look like us or think like us or act like us, to really truly go to the far shores of Galilee and to take the good news, to take the cold water, and to serve others. God, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. I'm so thankful for Pastor Johnny bringing that word today. What an encouraging word that is for all of us, not just the dads here and the fathers, but the mothers, the grandmothers, the students here. Listen, I wanna encourage you. God wants to use you. God can use you. And so ask yourselves these two questions. God, what are you trying to teach me? What were you speaking to me through this message? And more importantly, what do you want me to do about it? And when we take and we obey what God puts on our heart, that's the beginning of change. And God will use you to do things that you can't even imagine. That's the Heavenly Father we serve. And that's what we encourage you with today. We'll see you next week for Church Online. I wanna encourage you, if today blessed you, to share this, share this online, share the services so other people can find hope here at the local church. And we'll see you next week as we continue our reset.